Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Welcome always to Niles First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Welcome to this gathering of Christ's body in this world. As we are together and as we go from this place, may we fully represent what Christ calls us to be as hands and feet, as members of this blessed community. How good it is to be with one another, to reaffirm our covenant towards one another and towards God. How good it is to strengthen our resolve as we move through our lives. There is much to give thanks for, much to praise for, and much to celebrate together. You can see some of the activities we have coming up in our bulletin on the back. Uh, We are still looking for folks to sign up for Vacation Bible School. Um, And we are collecting for Vacation Bible School birdseed, pine cones, and peanut butter. You can guess what we're going to do with those. Uh, So feel free to collect those um, as well as the sign-up sheets in the hallway for any uh, position within Vacation Bible School we encourage you to participate in, as well as uh, Wednesdays when we have our VBS work nights. Uh, We have another Cairo camp coming up this week. Do we have anybody attending camp this week? Okay, just to make sure, I want to make sure if anybody is going that we have the opportunity to send out uh, letters to our campers and our conferees. So we'll look towards next week as well. Uh, Is there anything else we can name this morning in our gathering? All right, we've been quiet for a couple weeks in a row now. So uh, I know at camp, if it were this quiet, we would do uh, Father Abraham or head, shoulders, knees, and toes. I will not try that here. I will encourage us to be present, awake, alert, and enthusiastic as we move through our worship together. With that being said then, I invite you to join with me in our call to worship. Hear the good news, gathered people, and remember the greatness of the calling we have received. Reject any secret and shameful ways and instead proclaim truth openly. We hold this treasure in clay jars to show that all goodness is from God and not from us. Though we face challenges, we are not defined by this world, for we belong to the eternal realm of God. Amen. I invite us to rise if we are willing and able for our opening hymn, My Life is in You, Lord. I invite you to be seated. May we utilize this time to share with each other. You know what? We are kind of quiet today, and we need to join together in community. How about, how about we pass thanks? Who's in for it? <laughs> you don't have to if you don't want to. 
but I'm going to do it. <laughs> Peace of Christ be with you. Good morning. Also, I'm not just going to do it with Jeanette. I'm walking around here. Y'all feel free to move around if you want. Peace of Christ. <laughs> Peace. Now, now that we are awake and present, what do we have to share with each other? What are our joys, our concerns, our updates? Yes. Hallie is having surgery the 11th. How do you, how do you spell it? Oh, I guessed right. Good. Thank you, Shirley. Tom. We have an update on Howie. He went um, into the hospital on Thursday with a mild heart attack. When uh, they did a procedure on Friday, they found that there was over a 90% blockage that perhaps was missed from his last surgery. They put in a stent. Then Saturday, um, either he, he flatlined or there was some sort of issue where they had to use defibrillators and CPR. Uh, when I went to visit him, he was trying to work off of his phone. <sighs> So he is um, in need of prayer, most certainly, but he's not slowing down. Uh, so continue to keep Howie in your prayers, as, uh, and, and pray for Joanne, too, that she can keep him in line as he's, trying to, as he's trying to heal there. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we continue to keep Kathy Sprague in our prayers as she is uh, recovering from uh, breaking both arms. She's over in Lake Vista right now. Andy! Paco? We pray for Paco who broke his leg? Both lower bones, okay. Oh boy, okay. So we pray for Paco as he uh, continues to move through healing and perhaps another surgery. Shelly. At Big Lots and Niles. So we congratulate Aaron on this new job over at Big Lots. Paige Lynn. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. All right, so we continue to keep Barb Nelson in our prayers, and, and we pray for uh, Linda Emler's uh, family in her passing. We've been praying for her for, for a couple months now. Uh, George, George Ann, y'all can't move around on me. I don't know where anybody is. Okay, all right. So tomorrow, um, we continue to pray for George Ann as she goes uh, through for the cardio version uh, to, tomorrow.
Thank you, George Ann. I give a special thanks uh, to Andy, who helped us throw candy at the Fourth of July parade. If you happen to be in the in the crowd there, I know we were able to get you a couple extra pieces thanks to Andy's arm. So thank you for being there for that. Um, I'll also name. Uh, we got some results back for our. I don't, People are more of my concern as we come here. Um, animals are important, I understand this, and we hold a lot of uh, uh, emotions for our animals. So uh, we got a, a test result back for our 2%, and it looks like she has a bone cancer. Uh, we don't know how much longer. Um, we've been spoiling her as much as we could for the past 15 years, 14, 12 years, 12 years, right? Something like that. She gets treated better than the kids, so, I mean, she's doing okay. She's... <laughs> But we'll ask for prayers there. Also, Thanksgiving, the zucchini season is in. Zucchini season is a very difficult time for church folks because if you leave your doors unlocked in your car, you're going to end up with a zucchini in your vehicle. So uh, there's eggs and zucchini, and, and uh, we, we're starting the harvest barter. Uh, so if you have anything coming in from your garden, bring it in, and we'll uh, make sure that we can exchange it in the parlor. I do. I do. Better get it quick. They were going. Anything else we can name this morning? I invite us then into an attitude of prayer, bringing what has been named to us as well as that which goes unnamed, those joys, those concerns, all that we are that is known to God, may we bring it forth here that we might move as co-creators with the divine. I then invite you to hear the morning prayer and to join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Power of powers and Lord of lords. We gather in this place seeking your favor and presence, knowing you as a gracious God who abides with and within us. In presence and in mercy, we give thanks and praise to you, our compassionate creator. Here we recognize that this ministry in which we endeavor is only through your mercy and not by our own merit. And in your grace, we do not lose heart. Yet as we are confounded and confronted for this glorious gospel which we have been entrusted to, it seems often obscured or twisted from the glorious purpose in which it has been commended to us. The God of this world blinds the minds of unbelievers and obscures the revelatory light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. The pure message of service and love towards God and neighbor becomes coercive and confused. Help us, O oh God, to reject any ideology that seeks to merge your holy gospel with worldly power and dominion. Strengthen us to keep your divine word and message of salvation as truly good news for all people. We confess that sometimes we are tempted by the power by the pull of power, by the illusion of control. We are drawn to narratives that falsely promise security and greatness under the guise of faith. The allure to bring about heaven through worldly means is akin to the pride of the Tower of Babel. Forgive us, O Lord, when we forget that your kingdom is not of this world and that our only true allegiance is to Christ alone. Empower us then, O oh God, to renounce disgraceful and underhanded ways. Give us the courage to stand firm in your truth, proclaiming the gospel with sincerity and love. May our very lives be a testament to the glory of Christ, shining in our hearts to illumine the knowledge of your glory. As we carry this treasure in jars of clay, we acknowledge our own frailty and weakness. It is through this very weakness that your surpassing power is revealed. When we are afflicted, remind us that we are not crushed, 
When we are perplexed, sustain us so that we are not driven to despair. When we are persecuted, comfort us with your abiding presence. And when we are struck down, lift us up with your steadfast love. Help us to embody the death of Jesus in our own lives so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our jars of clay, our mortal flesh. May our witness be one of humility, grace, and unwavering commitment to the truth of the gospel, standing against any force that seeks to distort or dilute it. We pray for our nation and for our world, that the light of Christ might dispel the darkness of division, hatred, and falsehood. May your church May the body of Christ in this world be a beacon of hope, of justice, and peace, resisting the temptation to conflate earthly power with divine mission. Help us to live out the teachings of Christ in our daily lives. Help them to be our influence as we journey through this life. Indeed, May we find them front and center. May we join together in unison as we bring together those words that we were taught to pray when we say in one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so I invite us to turn to our Bibles once again. And once again we find ourselves in Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. This specifically, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. May God add a blessing to this in every reading of God's holy word. I invite us again into an attitude of prayer. Gracious God, May all that we have, all that we might become, all that we are, might it be for your glory. May our actions be influenced by what you call us to be. Might our words be those that glorify you. Might our very thoughts be pure and kingdom-oriented. May our entire selves, and therefore this, this entire gathering, might it be reflective of the kingdom of God that has been taught to us by your Son, the Christ. And may we, in all that we are, be pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. I have a tendency to be a fiercely loyal person. Whatever I'm a part of is the best. Doesn't compare to the other stuff, right? I'm proud 
of that which I am a part of. Now, pride gets a bad rap sometimes. And we should define what pride is in this situation. I think there's two kinds of pride. And we see both of these in Scripture. There is good pride, which stems, as John C. Maxwell would say, stems from our dignity and self-respect. Bad pride, then, is that deadly sin of superiority that reeks of conceit and arrogance. We both, we, we have a battle within ourselves, within these different kinds of pride. We are all proud of, of who we are, or we should be. We should, our identity should be one that is, that is God-driven. Uh, pride, good pride, then, is a recognition that the way that I have been created has a spark of the divine within it, Right? that I have been made with certain qualities that no one else has. And we've talked about this over the past few weeks in 2 Corinthians. You are uniquely you. No one else will ever be you. You have skills that no one else has. You are the best in the world at something. It might be flipping flapjacks. It might be the way you care for the flower out in front of your yard. Whatever it is, there is something that you do that no one else in this world has been able to do or will do. You should have pride in that because you have been created as the best for it. However, that becomes the sin of pride when it starts to be utilized over and against other people. Now, I am proud of a lot of stuff, and I have been since I was a little kid. I, um, I actually received most school spirit in, in high school. I was the proudest to go to Mineral Ridge High School. And still, I, I'm, I'm a Ram booster. I, I, I think that it's a wonderful school district. I tell other people how great being a Ram is. Uh, my, my name is still up on the wall somewhere. It's a lot lower than it used to be in track and field. There's been a lot of good athletes that have come through that have been a lot better than me. I am proud of where I went to school. And I am proud of how well that school is still doing. I'm proud to be from Ohio. I had to come back. It was weird living in Kentucky and West Virginia. Not that there was anything wrong with those states, but I don't even want to say Ohio's better, because I know Ohio isn't better, but it was better for me, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And there's an identity about it. There's an identity and a pride about being from the Buckeye State. There's something, no matter where in the country, no matter where in the world you go, if you shout out OH, I'm really glad you all followed through with that. But I know that no matter where I go in the world, if you shout it loud enough, you'll get that same response. There's pride in being from this space. We don't recognize it as better unless we're playing the team from up north, right? And then we're better. But most of the time we recognize that a lot of our pride is just because of our identity. I am fiercely proud to be a citizen of the United States of America. If you drive by our house, the flag is always flying, at least during the summer. I take it down in the winter because I try, and, I try as well as I can to uh, uphold the U.S. flag code. I, I place honor and respect in those symbols. I have pride in these things. Not pride that I think it's better, right? And there's the difference between those two concepts of pride. Pride in our identity, in the goodness of the values that we support, are a wonderful thing. It becomes the sin of pride when we start to think that we're better at others' expense. That is the sin of pride. I cannot tell you in words how proud I am to be a follower of Christ. Most of my identity the vast majority of my identity is being a follower of Christ. Now I got all these other little Venn diagrams. I'm proud to be a father. I'm proud to be a husband. I'm proud to keep bees. I'm proud to, you know, grow the garden that I do. But all of those, all of those Venn diagrams are over top of that overarching circle that says I am a follower of Christ and I am a Christian. That is my primary identity and I'm fiercely proud of it. Proud not in the sense that I think it's better, because I see the damage that Christianity has done and continues to do in this world. So how do we differentiate these concepts of pride? How do we uphold the good pride while dissuading and discouraging 
that sin of prideful vanity. I think we hear a little bit, and we have been hearing more as we went through uh, 2 Corinthians. As for the past month, if we've been looking at Paul's second letter in the church in Corinth, we see some of the issues that have come about because of this. Um, much of what Paul has been talking about in, in, as we've worked through the book is how we are responsible for ourselves to better ourselves. How we are called to live virtuous lives for the sake of the gospel. How we are called to be better tomorrow than we have been today. It is what our calling is as people of faith to better ourselves and to seek the betterment of the world around us. Now, if you fall into that deadly sin of pride, it becomes, well, I'm better and we don't need to work on anybody else, right? I'm better and you're just not as good. But the pride that comes from our identity is something that lifts up those around us. The pride that comes with being a Christian is one that demands that we work for one another. And at its best, the ideals of our country, the ideals of our state, the ideals of our communities should uphold those values of seeking to serve other folks as well. That is when pride is at its best. The problem is we keep screwing these things up. The problem is we keep falling short and suddenly our vision of what the world should be becomes what Jesus is or what the country is or what the state is or what our neighborhood is. I am proud to be a human. I'm proud because I get to share it with every single one of you. Folks that I don't meet never will. Folks that have come well before my time, folks that will come well after me. I don't think that I am better than any single person that has lived or will live. I think I might be better at certain things, but I don't think I'm better. And I think that's an important, an extremely important distinction. You might be the best at something that anybody else, than anybody else ever will be, but that doesn't make you better as a person. And that certainly doesn't mean that others are less than. The issue, as Paul names it in our scripture for today, is that the God of this world keeps getting in the way of the one true God. He says that in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, as Paul was writing it, he was probably talking about the God of this world being Satan. That was the um, concept of hamartiology, of sin, of, of, of evil in the first century ancient Near East. Paul is talking about an otherworldly power. But it has been translated and considered in different ways throughout Christian theology. Martin Luther names the God of this world as riches, pleasure, and pride. So if you have a tendency to demythologize scripture like I do, you might be able to read Martin Luther's quote as something with more meaning. If you follow concepts of good versus evil in, as your theology, you can see the dominion of Satan over this world. Whatever it is, and we're disciples, so we have multiple ways to interpret Scripture and we hold those in tension. If nothing else, we have a wonderful community within the Christian church, Disciples of Christ, because we can disagree with each other lovingly. And that is a rare, rare uh, attribute in our society today. We have a tendency, as soon as we disagree with one another, to see each other as the other. Like I was talking about in our pride with Ohio State. Those folks up north might be wholly other. Strangers, foreigners, can't be trusted, lock your doors, right? That's that pride that comes in with a bad name. Pride as we understand it in Christianity as something to uphold uh, individual worth and identity celebrates one another celebrates the uniqueness of one another and upholds everyone as equal in this world and, and worthy of the respect and dignity of being a creature of God. But there is something about this world that tends to twist and corrupt the best of our ideals. 
We see it with our country. We see it with our faith. Our faith stands for something incorruptible. Our faith looks towards the very realm of God, heaven on earth being established through Christ and through the Spirit working with us as co-creators. But for 2,000 years, we have messed it up royally. Every time we have a chance to create perfection, it looks a little bit more like somebody's version who's in power. Power corrupts. As Luther named it, the God of this world is riches, pleasure, and that deadly sin of pride. We've done the same thing with our country. Worse, we're beginning to conflate uh, th th our identity as nation with our identity as Christian. And the problems are obvious. I think we should name this and hold it in tension. This is something that I see clearly in Scripture, but I understand that we have different interpretations of. I also recognize that this is a hot topic issue, so I invite you to disagree with me. I challenge you to disagree with me. If you all agreed with me, I would be very, very nervous. I don't think everybody should agree with, with anyone about anything other than perhaps in this gathering that Christ is Lord. Amen? The rest we can disagree with and still love each other. The rest we can hold in tension and still work for one another. But I find a distinct difference between what we are called to do to better our country, to better our faith, and what is being done. I think we can name this as the difference between patriotism and nationalism. Patriotism is what makes me put a flag out front of my house to be proud of my identity as a person who lives in this country. Nationalism is that concept that we're the best at everyone else's expense. It's that sin of pride that takes hold and roots into our identity as United States citizens. Good pride, pride that leads towards growth, and betterment is the concept in, that, in patriotism that says it's a love and affection for our country. It's stemming from our ideals and values. Send me your huddled masses. Nationalism is the concept that stems from love and affection but moves to superiority. Patriotism is names that our country is great and certainly it is as long as we live into the values that we have expressed make us members of this community, of this country. Nationalism has a tendency to look at our identity and not consider the critical nature that we should carry it with. Like I was naming with Christianity, we should have the kingdom of God apparent in this world at this point. But every time we try and establish it ourselves, we end up messing it up. And it looks more like any other worldly kingdom. It looks like any other nation. Paul reminds us that the ministry that we have is not from us. Because we can't do this by ourselves. We are fallen people, sinful people. That's why we're here this morning. We need the grace of God and it is, we, we should be thankful and give praise to God that God is one who is merciful and just, who seeks our best interest even when we can't do what we need to ourselves. Patriotism looks towards what is going to happen a vision, an ideal of growth that means we can be better than we have been in the past. Nationalism seeks to go back to the glory days that never were. This is a nuanced conversation. It's nuanced in that pride can easily move from one side of that teeter-totter to the other. We can be prideful people in the sense that we are proud of our identity and hope to share that with each other, to make the world better through our identity. Like Spider-Man says, with great power comes great responsibility. We are a powerful people. 
When we look to that power as a way to help the world, to serve each other, to make things better than they have been, it is a pride that allows for growth. When we look to that pride and think we are better, and we slap our suspenders, and we think we should help less because we're better, it is sinful pride. We are reminded throughout our lives, Paul names to us, that the glory we receive is not our own doing, but it is God bestowing these things upon us. We contain within us the spark of the divine. You have a little bit of God within you, residing with you, abiding with you, moving with you as you go about your daily life. And the more you pay attention to the way that God moves with you, the more that you will see God, I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Our issue is that we are stubborn. And we always think we know better individually. Now, I don't want to say that that's the case across the board, but I know it's the case with me. And I think in humility, we could all probably agree that that's the case with each of us. None of us think we're wrong. Because if we were wrong, we'd change so that we're right. Right? If you know you're wrong, you're not going to hold that wrongness. You're going to change yourself. But one of the flaws with human beings is that we have a tendency to convince ourselves that we're right, even when the world is telling us we're wrong. And because of that, we keep getting ourselves in these situations where we don't live as God would have us live, but we live as we want to live. Because it's more comfortable, because it brings us those things that we desire in our lives, power, privilege, pride, and because of that, we keep messing up the direction of our faith. And we sully the ideals of our nation. We proclaim both as shining beacons on a hill, providers of truth and justice in this world. But when we fail to live up to those ideals and we are not critical of their failings, we can't be in dialogue about the truth of the world. Our only hope in this situation is to rely fully on the truth of the gospel, to bring back our identity primarily to Christ's followers, to live as Christ would have us live, to bring back those ideals and virtues that we have str struggled for and striven for within our nation and within our faith, to keep them separate so that they don't mess each other up, but to hold them in tension and to be prideful in good ways towards both. What we hear then is a promise that comes from Paul and through Christ that we, if we, if we renounce shameful things, if we refuse to hide shameful things, if we refuse to practice cunning, if we refuse to lie, if we uphold God's word as truth, if we speak openly and plainly to one another in the sight of God, then we can move masses, huddled masses, into the truth of God's glory. But it means we have to set aside and be critical of our country, of our faith, of our identity, those basic identity labels that we hold so dear. We have to be critical of them. We have to recognize the mistakes we've made. It's just like our individual lives. You're going to be in a lot of trouble if you don't name your mistakes. That is why I continue to uphold uh, the, the, the basic nature of Christian faith in, in being able to confess to one another. In fact, we could probably consider that as a same, similar allegory. When we go to confess to one another, now I've offered confession and so far no one's taken me up on it, but I hope you practice this in your daily life, that you admit your mistakes and you meaningfully apologize with friends, with family, with strangers. That you are honest with yourself about your identity. When you fail, you name your failures and apologize so that you can be better next time around. It is the same 
rule that we apply to individuals that here must be applied to our faith, to our identity as citizens. We should be critical of our failings so that those failings might be fixed. Our loyalty, the obligation of our loyalty to our identities is that we proclaim these things in truth. Institutions fail. Empires crumble. But the gospel of our Lord is eternal. And as we hear this good news, we hear that we must be critical of all the ways that we have lessened the glorious gospel in our lives. All the ways that we have hurt each other as individuals, as communities, as nation. And once we name these things, and once we can be honest with each other, we can get back to the work of building a greater space around us. Faithful, prideful, good pride, looking towards the realm of God fully realized. Might we be introspective in this space, considering the ways that we have fallen short of the glory of God? But might we not lose hope? For this ministry that we have been given is not ours, but is only possible through Christ. We don't have to worry about failing, though we should be honest when we do. Instead, we should lift up our eyes to the cross, see the mercy that is contained therein, and get back to work in building the realm of God in this space. That is our obligation. That is the loyalty to which we hold dear. Amen. Every time I come to this table, my pride takes a hit. So much of Christian history has been spent trying to figure out who is worthy to come to this table. Denominations have sprung up and have faded away over who might be worthy to come to this table. And every time that categories were made for who is welcome and who is separate, it ended up, up looking a whole lot like the people in charge that were welcome. And the people that weren't welcome looked different, spoke different, believed different. Every time we try and keep people away, we lessen the realm of God. Yet every time I come to this table, I consider, am I worthy? Should I be welcome? Because y'all, I've fallen very short. By my merits alone, I wouldn't be worthy to be at this table. And I don't know how you all feel, but I think we're all kind of in the same boat there. It is a good thing that we find grace at this table as well. We find an open welcome for all of us are not worthy to partake. But in God's grace and through Christ's life, teaching, death, and resurrection... We get to set aside those ways that we've failed. We get to set down the ways that we have hurt others and lessened the realm of God. We get to start fresh through God's grace, through reconciling ourselves to the divine. And as such, we welcome all to this table. All are found worthy through Christ, who has allowed us welcome and salvation and eternal life. May this be the pride that we carry through. And so I hand on to you the way that it's been handed on to me. That on the night that Jesus last ate with friends, with family, with those that would deny him, those that would betray him, those that would be responsible for his death, still he welcomed them and loved them. And he took a loaf of bread and after having blessed it, he broke it. Saying, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat it, eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup. A cup that he named as a pact, a, a new covenant of which we are a part of. That names who we are called to serve, what our identity should be, what our pride is in. 